everyone. Welcome to the Awesome Day of FileMaker Training. I'm Richard Carlton, creator of FMTrain.tv here at uh, 1 o'clock Pacific time. Some of you are in different time zones. In fact, most of you are in a different time zone. I want to welcome everyone. We are broadcasting in high definition on YouTube, Twitch, and Discord. This is the go-to place every day for an hour on FileMaker. Various topics, some topics you'll like, some topics you'll be like, eh, whatever. Some, some of you... We just like, I, I just want to see if Richard's still breathing, if he's fallen over dead on live TV. Yesterday, we did a live stream on upgrading older versions of FileMaker. So if you're in an organization, say like Ed is on using File, and I'm picking on Ed just because I like Ed and he's a cool dude. Um, he has his FileMaker 13. He's like, oh, I'm thinking about upgrading my FileMaker. What should I do? So we did kind of a dry run yesterday with this. We've talked about this on and off for decades with an S, but Claris is trying to, focus on this and they were kind of wringing their hands and trying to it's stressful we're not sure what to do right kind of thing so i'm like okay fine how about i just do one for everyone i'll just i'll just do it and then uh what we'll do is then we'll collect the data so i we finished yesterday's live stream two minutes later they came in to my uh, my studio at claris headquarters i was at claris headquarters yesterday and like richard you know, come to our meetings we're having a meeting and they're trying to have a uh, trying to talk about this stuff in an intelligent way. They're working. Um, I'm yesterday. We're we're coming up with a, a flow chart and a PDF to help guide you through the process of upgrading from a, an older version of FileMaker. I don't mean like a version from a couple of years ago, like FileMaker 19 and 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 later, any version 19, all the way up to FileMaker 21. It sounds like there's only 19, 20, and 21, but 19 was actually. Uh, spanned over like four years and as are three and a half years four years yeah it's quite a long time and so it's really it's 19 19 1 2 3 4 5 6 and then there was 20 and then there was 21 so then they went back to this idea of a major release every year kind of thing and it's kind of loosely done that way they do major releases whenever they feel it's major but they do release every three or four months but the short version is they're trying to get their heads wrapped around the launch schedule for the next year one what they're delivering to all you folks next year and also making sure that there's some sort of um flow chart diagram uh of the upgrade process today is going to be on two different topics it's kind of an open q a day um i want to anyone asking any questions feel free we had like a hundred more people here yesterday than normally because we had this upgrade conversation if any of you are here from yesterday you want to talk about upgrades you have additional questions write the questions in discord YouTube or Twitch, we're broadcasting on all three. We're watching those comments. Um, some of them I can see over here. If I point that way on the computer, um, I, if you see me looking over here, ask because I'm reading the questions. Margaret's also keeping an eye on the questions. So with that in mind, I want to remind everyone that this is a lot of free material. Oh, and one other. So and then if you want to support the channel, subscriber access is greatly uh, appreciated. You purchase one of the bundles. So once you purchase a bundle, then your subscriber access. Get, you get access to that. So that's uh, pretty awesome stuff right here. So um, we have basic plus and complete bundles. There are different levels in here. If you have questions about this, let us know. Uh, shoot us an email to support, but we do appreciate it. Now, we are going to do what we used to call the 30-day intensive FileMaker training from from the I don't know anything to as, as awesome as we can make you in 30 days. The rub is that we keep adding curriculum to that. So we're up to 45 days, which constitutes two months. So what's going to happen with that stream is that we are going to do the first week for everyone on the live stream. And then everyone who is a current subscriber will have access to that. It'll be at a different time slot. It'll be a little bit earlier in the day. And so that way you can come to that if you want. It's going to be hard on my team because we'll be doing two hours of training per day. But I'll be largely doing the training there. But I want to make sure that the, the subscribers get premium access to the premium fundamental training. And so some of you know a lot of stuff. So like, I don't really need to know about what a field is or what a relationship is. Or I can do many to many relationships and and Cartesian joins with a Smurf, uh, a Smurf frosting and a cherry on the top. You're good with all that. Cool. Um, but we will be going from the beginning up to kind of very advanced types of things. And uh, if you want to access that material, be part of that class, you need to have a current subscription with FMTrain.tv. With that in mind, Margaret, if you want to giant chime in or join in or anything, are we good? We your... are good. I sent you Rev3. I'm sure you'll find new bugs immediately. But uh... <laughs> okay, so let me go through the use case on this real quick. So this is something that I built the other day. Uh, some of you may have saw me uh, talking with Nick about it a little bit. So here was the use case. Um, 
These guys at Big Valley Aviation, they've been paper for a long time. They've finally been dragged into the 1990s. Oh, wait a minute. The 2000s? No. The 2010s? No. The 2020s? Are we twenty? That what you say? We're in the twenty twenty. I guess we're. I guess we're. Yeah, we're in the twenty twenties. Welcome to the twenties. Except the twenties could have been either these twenties or the last twenty. So anyway, um, uh, so they've been dragged into this. They're not big on photographing uh, issues yet. Um, but I have been busy using the software, um, and then also realizing that I wanted to attach photos. So we had a maintenance, uh, run here done on a helicopter, and I attached three hundred photos. Not anything that was wrong, it was all the things that were done by the mechanics um, in conjunction with myself when we were there. And one of the things that kept coming up is that I, I would have a photo in there and then I would drag and drop and I would lose track of which photos had been added because there's 300 of them. And I'm like, do I have a picture of that little oil plug chip thingy magnetic thing where it grabs all the magnetic bits out of the bottom of the engine? So if they start to collect, you know that metal is grinding like in a car you don't have a chip detector there's no such thing if they if the car if the engine on the car eats itself you quit going and you pull the side of the road you're supposed to pull the side of the road so in an aircraft though it starts detecting the little little bits of that are you know like it's like uh it's like the residue of sawdust if you're cutting wood and then you get all the sawdust well if you start shredding metal the little bits are flying around they're magnetic generally and they'll collect at the bottom and a little magnetic detector thing can connect the circuit and a little light comes on saying that your engine or whatever is about to quit working, right? It's kind of like a, a light that you should take seriously, mostly. Um, some, of the, some of the lights are really critical. Some of them are like, eh, we can land in 10 or 15 minutes. It's not going to quit working between here and there. But anyway, uh, I take pictures of these little elements. I take these pictures and I forget. And so suddenly I have duplicate photos. So let me walk you through the customer use case and the final feature. Then we have a sample file for you here that Margaret extracted out of here. And we're going to go through the very, very, the basic basics of this thing. Um, and once you understand how it works, it's pretty straightforward. You can adapt it, take the sample file and steal it yourself if you want, or adapt the, the idea. So, um, so I'm gonna jump on this one right here. This is the, this one right here. And so the, when you see these discrepancies, these are all the little, these are the tasks of a project. So if you have jobs or a project, you have the tasks or the, I don't know who's here. I don't wanna um, talk ill of anyone. Uh, Foxy Jack, Gadidi, Ed, hey everyone, everyone's here. Gadidi, Otter, Liberty, Liberty, Mike, it's kind of a small group. Uh, Michelle, Michelle Gravel, the, hey, how's it going? Montreal, welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad you are there. Yeah, so um, this is all the stuff you're supposed to be doing on a project, right? So it's like kind of a standard project. It's like starting point, right? This came from starting point. And so the customer calls and work orders, fine. It's not a, it, it was a project section, we renamed it. And so this is a portal of all the things, right? And so we have a portal in here. There's a sort order based upon this number over here. And I have a couple in that say, if it's a section title, it, it reverses it. But that way it looks like it's a section, but it's just another portal, okay, all pretty cookie cutter. Then over here I have like five pictures and it says, remove the accessory gearbox chip plug and inspected and tested. So I press the little button right here, it says five, and I get, these are, these are the, th this, right, this is actually probably another conversation we could have, but these are all the photos over here that I could grab and stick. So these are the ones attached to the discrepancy. It should say already, it should say right here, already attached to this discrepancy or this, Thing I did, and if I if I don't know what it is, I can click on it and pop it up, and and, it, and then there's the chip plug. So this is the part of the bottom of the engine. The little metal bits kind of filter down here, and then there's a little magnetic connector, and then there's the wire, and that wire gets a uh, voltage applied to it if the little metal bits connect the circuit, sets off the light on the instrument panel, right? So that's how that works on airliners. Uh, Cessnas don't really have it, but anything bigger than a Cessna is probably going to have some sort of chip plug. This is what it looked like after I removed it. So there, it was unthreaded, came out, some oil came out, so we clean it all up and then inspect it and everything else. So here's the problem. I go, I go, I want to add additional images, but I'm having duplicates. And over here are the images that have not, they were attached to the project, but they haven't, they're attached to the overall project, but they haven't been uh, specifically attached to a specific job that we did. So I could say, show all, all the images, including that one right there, I think is it, it is sure looks like that one right there. It's got the same ID discrepancy if you look at it. Does it have the same ID discrepancy? Oh, so that is the same one. So this is all of them, even if they're already attached. 
If I say unattached, this is the ones that have not been glued in somewhere, okay? Or I say attached to a different discrepancy, which means that they, I think they were attached to the wrong one and I can go steal them, right? Like say this had something to do with the chip plug. That's not a chip plug, but say it was, I could press this button and it would steal it and add it over here. So this is all the stuff we're trying to do. So before this happened, before we were managing this, we had this option right here. We would say, hey, uh, I, I hit a picture right here, drag and drop a photo for the McWidget. So this is a hydraulic servo right here. I'm going to drag it on here. And and then I could put a description. This is the, uh, you know, the Ed Burkle fire blah, 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 servo. Blah, 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 it's a description, doesn't matter. And I say add to the work order. Okay. Now you're like, that's great. It did it. And it, it added it wherever it went. I'll have to go back and clean that out in a little bit. And you say, well, now I could have had it loop back again. But the way it's set right now is it just does one photo at a time. But you could have it clear the screen and go back. So let's so say it's a week later and I have these photos on my phone or on my desktop and I drag it in here again. Then I get this error message. This photo appears to be a duplicate. This might be okay unless you did it on purpose. If you did it on purpose, otherwise you should cancel. So we can keep the photo or cancel. Now the way this works for those of you wondering is that these are these are two are global fields right here. And so at, at the point where I have done this check, I put the image into a global. I, I have a global down here. Only when I press this button does it take it, add a new record, and do a set field out of the, the global field uh, into the permanent fields, right? If I say cancel, it's not one of those deals where you go back and delete the record. Deleting the record in a deal like this is always dangerous. You really want to minimize the number of delete script steps you have, any opportunities for you to because yeah, if, if your script ever does something wrong, it'll delete something important. That always makes me horrifically nervous. So I'm going to hit cancel. It's not going to delete a record. All it does is clear the globals. A much safer thing to do. I'm going to go and do that. All right. Uh, did it just say added it? Yeah, that's a bug. That's a, Margaret, that's a bug. You're going to write that down. I'm pretty sure it didn't add it. Um, it so, did not add it. And this is the transient notifications that goes on that we needed. We got from Kyle Williams. So Kyle did a great job. He, he created that for us, and I use it. I, I, everything that I teach everyone, I, I eat my own dog food. That's that's why I'm as aggressively pro, – uh, I communicate this aggressively as I can because I use it. I know it works. So let's talk about the mechanics of duplicate detection. Now, as a side note, FileMaker server in a database, in an FMP12 file, if you put an image in a database – and then you put the exact same image in the database. It's not going to alert you. It's a duplicate, but it will know using a similar technique to what we're doing. It will know it's a duplicate and it won't save it twice in the FMP12 file or wherever the documents are saved. It won't save it twice. It'll just say, oh, it's a reference. Remember the other day we were talking about FileMaker server and the ink um, and the hard linking of the backups where if something hadn't changed, it doesn't save another copy. It just links to it. This is that same kind of idea. So if, if I put the image in once, yeah, it's going to save the server. The server's 80 or 100 miles from here. But then if I save it again and again and again, because I decide that's important, it's just going to make a link to it. It doesn't save the whole five megabyte image. So there's a lot of performance improvement there. So that's kind of what we're doing, except in our case, we want to alert the person that this is already a duplicate. Are you sure you really want it? Because uh, there are times you, you could want the same photo on two different, on two different items. But most of the time, it's a user error, and they're not aware that they're screwing this up. And so it, it brings it to their attention, allows them to make a choice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, – I'm going to – what I'm going to do is pop through Margaret's sample file. i got a pop error sample file. All right, let me uh, test it to see if it actually works, Margs. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go and close the Big Valley Aviation one. I'm going to close. That's our second demo for the day. All right, so what I'm going to do is i got three records in here real quick, and I've got the uh, – this is, if I just look at it, that is the front end of a hydraulic servo that is on the helicopter, okay? Um, doesn't really matter. It's some sort of mechanical, whatever. It doesn't matter. And so here's the thing. I want to put the image here. In an ideal world, it needs to scan it and compare it to the other photographs. So there's no function called compare the, the bits of this file to the bits of this thing. There's no command that says compare the bits, but there are other things you can do. You can see this container hash right here. Let, let me simply say 
This is, I believe, a UUID. And the chance of getting a duplicate UUID in the world of UUIDs is like one in 13 billion or something like that. That's why people like to use UUIDs as a primary key in a database, because what are the rules of a primary key? Every primary key is unique. That's why I always use one, two, three, four, five. It's serial, it's sequential. It could never run into itself, right? Um, some people, there, but there's reasons to use a, uh, uh, as a more advanced developer, to use a UUID as your serial number, a big one of which is offline synchronization. So Ed Burkle has inspectors that are using iPads or laptops. They have a local database, not connected to the FileMaker server, because I've been told that when you're in the attic of a Chinese all-you-can-eat buffet, frequently the internet drops out. I, I did have a fire inspection customer in California tell me that. And I'm like, okay. So they had an offline copy, but it mean that they could create records offline and they could never run into the uh, records that were created on the live one at the same time because they would sync later. UUIDs fix that problem. For training, I hate it because it's hard to explain to people what a primary key is. And then they see this random string of because it for a normal developer, even I'm a senior developer, that looks like I have no idea what that is. It's just a, it's a random string, but it's a UUID. Just the way that is. So what this UUID is special because it represents the totality of this of this image. So this image is a pretty big image. And through some magical formula and encryption and some Oompa Loompas and a couple unicorns that were sacrificed to make this, it distills this image down to this unique string. And it will distill it down to that unique string every time. It's like if I kind of reduce this and reduce this and reduce this down and I get the string, um, I can get that from this image, I get the string, but I can't take this string and reverse the process and get the image, right? Because clearly as you reduce down, you're losing data, but it's supposed to be unique. So it's kind of like a sausage. I mean, it's kind of nasty, but if you think about how sausage is made. It's a one-way process. Uh, it's a one-way process. This is like <laughs> that. So the pig goes in and out comes sausage. It doesn't go the other way, right? Which is really kind of so. It's not like Base sixty four where you can encode it and then decode it to get the image after the a fact. Base sixty four representation of this. Um, if I did this, it would be a giant. It wouldn't be a single UUID. It would be a a text box with thousands and thousands and thousands of characters on it. So this is because no matter how okay, say let's check this out. If I have a if I make a little tiny image, I'm gonna like I'm a, a wee tiny, like I'm a little red one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna screenshot this little red cap right here. Got a little bit of safety wire on it. So that is a lot smaller. That's a lot smaller. Is that not much smaller? Okay. Yes. One, two, three, it should save. Come on, Mac. Oh, finally. Okay. Create a new record. I'm gonna drag it over here. If it's so much smaller, it should make a smaller hash. No. Oh. <laughs> It reduces these down till they get a probably that should be about 32 digits worth of hash thereabouts something whatever that is. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it, they all generate this same size. But if I do if I do another record and I put this exact same now what if I so like so just for fun uh, I'm gonna say new record and I'm gonna if I well let me just let me just test it for sure. So let me view this as a list. Can I view it as a list? Well, let me it has the option, but it's got a fat bottom. So maybe oh, hit layout mode. Fat bottom. All right, yeah. so let me, let me uh, put it on a diet. It's a Friday diet. Swoop. Swoop. Okay. Uh, there we go. Browse. All right. So this image is that. This image is that. I bring now. This is a little tiny one. I'm going to put it down here again. And I don't think your script triggered. Huh. Okay. But you were on another record. Which oh, that's, yeah. Okay, let me that's do it. That's interesting. Way. Okay, I'm down here. I'm going to do it right here. Okay, it sees it sees a duplicate. So I'm going to say keep photo. As he knows, I put it in here. Forget this one right here. I don't know what happened there. It's some sort of little bug. This image here generated this. This image here generated it. Now, 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 I am going to trim, and I mean a micro slice out of this thing. A micro I mean, this image is almost freaking perfectly identical. Okay, I'm going to crop that. And I'm going to save as 
Did I just hit save? I must hit save. You just hit save, yes. Okay, that's stupid. Okay, now I'm going to start a new new record. I'm going to be on the record. I'm going to bring this over. Now, I trimmed off one row of pixels, I think, on the left side or the bottom, whatever it was. Click there. Mm, totally different. So being off one pixel causes that formula to change. Okay. So all of you can see this. I mean, clearly you put it in and then, the, then it says a script trigger and it says, hey, is Charlie 4 Echo 818 anywhere else in here? And it goes, yeah, it is. In this case down here, it goes Delta 37 Alpha. Is it there? Crickets. You don't hear anything. Okay, it's good. Drop it in there. At the end of the day, that's all this is. Questions. We got, oh, we got a whole bunch of questions. So we have comments. Uh, David is trying to guess what you're doing to get that's, it to go. Uh, I thought it was that initially. Um, I think. Oh, it, I mean, that's what I re-enabled to get that, it to work. So. Is that what you did? Is that the one you used, Margaret? Yes. That, so if there's another one, I am unaware. Oh, no, it, it's. Uh, well, I thought there were a couple different ways of doing it, but you need the hash is what you need. So if you go to, it's what they call a hash. It's actually how, <laughs> this is a side note. This is, well, remind me, ask, tell me about FileMaker security and passwords because it uses this. Okay. Thing. So remind me about that. So what script do we run when we, let me, let me just do this again. Uh, you run 2022. So I'm on this script right here. I'm going to do script debugger. And I'm going to say, put in this one right here. So before anything happens, this is an on object modify. So it sets this, it sets this, it performs a subscript, which is the validate. And the validate basically says, first, I need to get the hash. So the hash is right here. It's get container attribute. There it is. So is David, David, get plus five points for being awesome. Okay. Um, that puts the hash in here. That's actually the hardest part. Most of the uh, FileMaker developers would, uh, from here, would understand that, well, now we're going to grab that, pop a new window, do a find, right? Pop a new window is an important part of that. So we're going to set the variable to hash. Then uh, one thing we're going to check to see if, the, if somehow we triggered the script, but there's no, like if I would had an image in there and I deleted the image out, that would still trigger this. So we're testing to see like an edge case of where there's nothing in there, right? Uh, there's something in there. Then we say new window. Whenever we're doing processing stuff to interact with the user, we always start a new window so we don't monkey with the user's world. Now, the, it might cause the screen to flash. Uh, if you really don't like the flash, you could also have it spawn the window off screen by giving it a negative coordinates, right? Like instead of, you know, this is like bot 100 by 100 and 200 by 200. If you did negative 100, 200, it'd be off the screen up that way, right, kind of thing. Pop a new window. Okay, now that's a new window. I'm just going to move it so we know it's a new window. Okay. Enter find mode. Search for the hash. Perform find. I have one record uh, already found. And so what it is is that what we found is that as of the time we run this, this had not been saved. Or it's a global or whatever it is. It may be a global. Okay, but the point is is that we, we know that, that uh, if there's zero – hits that means that it's nowhere in the system if there is a single hit like a record one we know that the, this is already in the system somewhere so these are globals right and we haven't saved it yet so if it finds one already in there it's not the one we just did it's a previous existing one pretty straightforward okay so then it's it says it um it's not an image or it's an original or whatever we say maybe it's a, a uh, it's an original and that one goes in there Okay, so it did that. Did that work work correctly? Did I have that one in here already? I did not. Okay, so then if I run it again, it's gonna it's gonna see it as being. It'll do a found set. It'll find um, two records. So whatever you understand the idea is that if there's two of these, that's one of them's a duplicate. If there's one of them, then it's not. So it's pretty straightforward. Margaret can save this amplifier and give it to you. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about that. The chance of this get becoming a duplicate hash. So here's the backstory on the way this works with FileMaker. So FileMaker passwords, when you set up an account in FileMaker, it doesn't, back in FileMaker 6, this is one of those reasons why you should upgrade, but in FileMaker 6, FileMaker would actually save the actual username, well, usernames are always saved, but the actual password, you know, like doggy5 or something, whatever, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it would actually save that in the file. Um, as starting with FileMaker 7, they took the password that you put in and they would create a hash of it. So they would deal with the hash. So if, if in the event someone got the hash or got it out of the file, which they figured could 
could happen. And, and of course, some people built little password hackers for FileMaker um, that they could get out your hash. So maybe your password is doggy blue 55, but the hash is this thing right here. So that's what FileMaker would do. So FileMaker would say, so, and of course, I guess it's possible that, that you could have two passwords with the same hash. Claris wasn't too terribly worried about that. They just didn't want anyone actually ever getting your original password. And so when you go to a password hacker application, it finds the uh, account and it what it does, it clears the hash. Um, it just clears it. So then you can enter the file with no password. So that's where the encryption at risk technology comes in where you encrypt the entire file. You encrypt the entire file because what ends up happening is that unless you can get unencrypt the file with that password, you can't even get to this point where you can open it up and take it apart. So uh, encryption at rest um, is an important thing. Once again, I want to caution everyone. I had a uh, customer a couple days ago when we they took their file off of server A and they moved it to server B and they put encryption on rest with it. And they did it themselves and deliberately didn't want to share it with anyone else, including RCC. Then the other day, they managed to uh, blow an upgrade and lose the ear. And so they were unable to open their file and they're dead in the water. They, I'm not clear on how they managed to wind their way back where they found the original file on the original server. As a result of that, uh, when, what ends up happening is that uh, <laughs> they got their, they got it running again, but they thought they were out of, they thought their company was out of business. And so you need to write the ear passwords down as a side note. I got another email from another individual from, I think, Germany, and he ran into some users who were using guest access with FileMaker files with important data in there. And he was horrified that a FileMaker developer uh, would, would have guest access turned on on a file. As a reminder, if you're in FileMaker security, I'm just giving everyone the, the friendly warning, is that you have admin, you have this guest access. It's not turned on by default. If you turn this on, you've got to be really careful about what data is in the database because really a talented person, unless you've got everything really, really well locked down, if they get into the file, they can cause problems. And this guy wasn't really a FileMaker person, so he's talking about doing a file A talks to file B and file A trusts file B and he creates file B and then uses admin access or guest access to get in and go laterally. That used to be a uh, security vulnerability back in the early days. You can turn that off now. You can protect against that. But he was like, hey, Richard, you need to tell all your viewers about this because clearly if someone doesn't do the security wrong, it's Richard's fault for not teaching you about it. So um, I said, happy to, to spread the word on that. So the other one I want to talk about um, and before we get uh, going too far is another one that we haven't talked about this one in a while. And I haven't talked to Excelsis people in a long time. It's another FileMaker consultancy that is in existence. Over the years, there was a guy named Andy Parsons. He might be retired by now, uh, but he had a great sample file that was really phenomenal. It was called, it's called this double click uh, right here. And I think we can go to their website or find this file or we can give a link to it or whatever. Um, Margaret, if you want to do a search for the double click, in the uh the bit oh is it in bitly okay Pro it's probably referenced in there one way or the other um so you open this file up all copyrights and appropriate attributions go to andy persons uh at uh, excelsis and so this goes back this is 10 years old and someone and i asked margaret about this and I said margaret do you ever remember us covering this she goes oh, i don't remember this so this is the idea of double click and how to trap and use double click. And so it's another little snuggly nugget of knowledge that might be useful for you. Um, and the idea, of course, people don't, if you're on the desktop of a computer, then you have this idea that, well, I can click here or I can double click it, right? And then a window should pop up if you do it fast enough and the computer's paying attention. And so how do you do that in FileMaker? There's no fundamental double click in FileMaker. <clears throat> so I have a click me right here, click once, and then there is double click. And you're like, aha, how is that? Anyone interested in this one? I mean, I want to see it myself. Personally. You want to see it? Okay, there's the link from Excel. Is it still on their website? Uh, I, I clickied and it worked. So. <laughs> Excellent day. Yeah, it's kind of a little bit of a hack of how it works. Oh, yeah, it's right here. Good for them. Yeah, Andy Person is a good guy. He, uh, we had permission to talk about this and demonstrate this. If they have it on their website, perfect, and download it from them. So if I run this, if I look at this, uh, it's kind of a subtle 
a little bit of a subtle hat trick. It's not hard to implement. Um, if I double click, it says click me. It performs a script it's called double click. And then the optional script parameter is get script name. And so here is an important subtlety. This whole thing, it pivots on this, this concept. When you press a button in the FileMaker interface to run a script, at the point you press it and it begins, no script has been started. So if you think about it logically, and this is a subtle thing, I'm on a layout or I'm in browse mode and a user clicks. At the point they click and the mouse comes up, any of the triggers that could be activated from that would be activated. Let's assume there's no triggers. Um, but the button is actually uh, going to fire a script. And so at the point FileMaker says, hey, this is going to run a script, FileMaker actually literally looks up the information in its own little database, in its mind, and it says, oh, I should run this script right here, and this is a script parameter. At the time it comes over here to look at this, Margaret, is the double-click script running. I clicked it. FileMaker initially doesn't know what to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. So it says, what do I'm supposed to do with this, dumbass? All right, I've got to look it up. <laughs> so it looks it up. And it looks up, and it sees this screen right here. Literally, is what it's doing, OK? Is, a, is the script running yet? Mm, well, it is running, isn't it? Because it has to check whether I, or not you've done the double click. You just, you just made it up. I'm confused. So. OK, let's, let's go back to your script. Let's go back to your file over here, the little sample file that we built over here. This is really important. This is subtle. And this is kind of important, though, uh, because this will affect you in other areas. So if this is a button right here, right? Is that button actually functional, Margaret? Is that a functional? It does. It works. OK, there we go. So I'm going to go to layout mode. I'm going to double click this. So you click on this as a user. And you click once, and FileMaker goes. It doesn't know what to do. So it looks up what it should do. And it sees what it should do. At the moment it sees what it should do, has it done it yet? No. That is the golden nugget of knowledge that's here. If you understand that, that'll explain why you do some things and they don't work and other things work weirdly. It looks it up. It sees it should run 2030. Then, literally as another step in the process, it activates the script. You can see this on the debugger. If we watch the debugger here, and this is subtle, if I go script debugger, watch what happens. I'm gonna press the button. Right now, it says a button. This is the call stack down here. Can we see this? The call stack says button has been activated. Is there anything about a script in here? It, sa it, it, it says this is what it should do. It should perform this script. But the call stack shows what's actually active. Is the script active yet? No. So step one is it looks it up to see what it should do. Then the next, the very next immediate step is it activates. See right here, it's hierarchical down here, Margaret. I don't think we've ever talked about call stack with you. There's the first step. There's the second step. So the second thing it does is activates 2030. Make sense? Yes. So if, 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 I'm going to go back to this. So based upon that logic, when you press the button, is the script you're calling, is it active yet? No. Okay. Now, extend that thought. Oh, hang on. I'm over here. I'm going to stop. I'm going to extend this process a little bit. I double click. So if I'm about to activate this script, but it's not active yet, what will get script name returned? Current. Well, this should say get current script name, but they it, don't have more current there. It won't return anything because nothing. Correct. Okay. Now, if you click once uh -huh. and it goes off, and then you click a second time right behind it. Is a script running on the second click? Oh, it would already have started. Yes, but it, so this a script is running, and what will get script name return? It will return the current script that is running. And if you understand that, you understand this trick. You can, you can recycle this demo. This is great. But at the end of the day... That's so what, what happens then? Does like the script get does it, the first run it, of the it, script it, get it aborted immediately? It, ah, it's it, it gives you 0. 0.3 seconds. You can change this. It's gonna oh. wait 0.3, which almost no one will ever notice. It's a little almost like a pregnant pause on a live stream. It's like where we're talking and suddenly it's like 
oh, okay, pregnant pause. A little bit of a weird, uh, um, what they call it, awkward pause. And so at, during that point three, it's just waiting. And you can have a script that you call where a script is already running in FileMaker. That's one of the things we almost never think about this. Back in the old days, we used to mess with it all the time. Options down here. It says, if you run a script and a current script is already running, what do I do? Halt the previous script, exit the current script, resume the script, or just pause the current one. So if you hit the click the second time, it's going to call the same script. So the so the first the first script that was activated on the first pass has been paused, and now it's activated this, the, the same script a second time. And when it runs a second time, it's still going to do the point three pregnant pause thing, but then it's going to come down here and say, hey, uh, did this get script name return something valuable? And if it does, it says it's a double click and it halts. And when you halt, it halts everything. Remember the difference between an exit and a halt. Yeah, you, so you. I think you told me that like a halt was a complete dead. Halt is stop, stop right the f now. Like stop, like what part of stop don't you get, right? Hands mm -hmm. in the air, don't shoot, halt. Otherwise you're gonna catch lead for your business, right? So yeah, see, so that's very serious. A exit is like, yeah, stop the one we're in, but keep going. Make sense? That's yes. all this is. Is that clever or what? That's extremely clever. I didn't- Yeah, Andy Parsons, FileMaker Jedi. It's like peak cleverness. Peak, peak cleverness, yeah. Yeah, script uh, stack. Uh, this, this, the script stack. Yeah, that's technically the correct way to say it. A lot of people don't look at the, the script stack too much. Um, for me, it's a little bit weird, but yeah, you can see how things kind of got to where they are. Um, but anyway, that's is very. That, so the point three gives you time before it evaluates. Does that make sense? It gives you time. So if you're like, like on some of your computers, you're like, well, I'm a really slow clicky person versus someone who's like. Right, so you could adjust that number, Margaret. Does that make sense? Yes. That pause is the window to catch the second click. Got it. Okay, and generally people double click pretty speedily. So. Well, when they're twenty-five, yeah, or twenty-eight, whatever. Yeah, Nick showed uh, time ago, David Angel. Yeah, no, this is going to be a repeat for some of you, right? I've covered this on the live stream. This is probably the third time over the last four or five years this has been covered. So, uh, some of you, this is like if this is old news for you, then I can't help you with that, right? Uh, Monday will be a uh, re recontinuation, um, and at the end of the day, a lot of the live stream stuff. Uh, is a uh, lot. I mean, some of it is like totally, totally new, um, but a lot of it's new for you, some of the people here, because you haven't seen it before or you forgot about it, or maybe you saw it before, but you weren't in a uh, mental state to absorb the, the instruction. Um, that's become something, as I get older in my years and, I, and I'm interacting with people in Claris, I realize that you can talk to someone they can look right at you and they are unable to process what you're saying because they're not in a state or in a place where they're able to process it. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I avoid using uh, Mike. They're talking about halts and stuff. Um, it's too like the on timer. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things like exit mostly is good. Um, but every once in a while where I want to make sure something's really stops dead and I will use a halt on that. In this case, you have to use it. Um, it's not really an option here because you want it to stop with the spinning stack thing, right? Where it's calling itself, um, kind of important. Um, so yeah, very, very, very important on that. Um, so other questions, it's kind of early today, but I'm kind of willing to cut, cut every cut, cut class early and let everyone uh, take the day. Any questions from Canberra, Foxy Jack, Mikey, Scott? Uh, you wanted to talk about security passwords and hashes at some point, but did we, no, we, we did. Okay. Yes. I was briefly distracted by um, sample filing stuff for people. Okay, yeah. No, we talked about that. So once again, the hash it, hash is loosely a smaller representation of the original. Um, and so like, again, it's a sausage process. A pig makes sausage process. It's a one-way process. So from the bigger thing comes a smaller thing, and it, you can't reverse it. It doesn't. You can't take a hash and turn it into the the bigger thing. Um, but it's really great. So keep in mind in a database like this, as you start to have hashes, right? You have hashes in here. 
um, if you have a, uh, you know, you're, what you want to do is store these and hide them. And then if someone doesn't uh, puts another one in, you can do a search for that hash to see how many times this Charlie four echo eight thing it goes find mode and it goes in here and it finds that and then it finds two once again a new window offsite pops a dialog or however you want to handle that process of uh, telling the user that they've entered it twice now here is the 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 <laughs> the as i will refer to this process it's one of those things like oh that's nice i was uploading so i take pictures on my iphone and i have a process on the iphone to upload them in the database then i take the same photo put it in Dropbox, then on the Mac, I take Dropbox and drag it on there. Guess what? Those hashes, I, it was like malfunction. I'm like, what the hell's wrong with this? When you take a picture, unless the picture is raw with no compression, compression occurs on the image, whether you can see it or not, and it makes it mathematically smaller, like it zips it kind of. The problem with compression, most time it's lot, there's, it's a kind of a lossy compression. So which means that some of the bits are ejected and it, it's like a sausage making process. It's a one way thing. So when the iPhone gets it, it, it might be an H E I V pro, uh, file format with that compression. But then once it comes out through Dropbox, I think Dropbox monkeys with it. And so by the time it get the images look identical, the sizes are from our perspective identical, but there's enough different pixels in between the two that the hashes come out different. So the, the flow of the images, the workflow as they exist and they go through life until they eventually hit the database and they show up has to be identical. If they go, well, it was on a Windows computer and it did this thing and then it came back, but in, in both cases, they're a, a JPEG with maximum quality or something, right? They're going to come out different. They're going to come out. Like if I take an image, let's do this. This will be fun. I'm going to close that. I'm going to, I'm going to get, this is the, uh, this is, this is this one right here. Is that what this one is right here? Okay, great. So that's the current one. I'm going to delete that one. So I have this one right here. Command J. All right. Oh, there's two of them. This one's blank. Delete that one. We'll delete that one. All right. So I have the one red one right here. So. If I create a new one, I put a put it in here. We're establishing that we get Delta 37 for Alpha Keep Photo. Okay, great. Now I'm going to open this up, and I'm going to say it's currently a. If I get info on it, it's a PNG. So can I save as or export? Let me save it back as a PNG again. I'm not sure what the Alpha does. The Alpha will change something that'll like monkey it up. So we'll call it PNG2 or something, okay? Save it, okay? I open this one. This one, this one, man, they look identical, right? But you can take it to the bank that somewhere in there, a pixel got changed and it's gonna be different. Yeah, one Bravo 70A. That's the rub. So the workflow for all of you, if you wanna use this in mm -hmm. the way that you used it, has to be the same. So it can't like it, like it'd be an AI thing where look at this photo and it's back to like this, like a robot authentication. Please identify all the fire hydrants in this picture. Or some of them like, please turn this goat's head so it matches the act of the goat. So you make the picture complete. Try because the AIs are getting smarter, right? I, you know, you need an AI here that looks at this and says, yeah, that's really pretty close. And, and even though precisely per the the precision scientific metrics of the universe, they're different. They are human close, like human identical, which they are. So there you go. So that's it for today. Similar function can be done while typing, keystroking, start with similar timer, one to second. Should keep, yeah, yeah, good for filters. Yeah, I don't know if I've done the uh, demo on the filter with the delay on there. One to two seconds on the keystroke, yeah. Now, key, keystroke stuff is good. Just keep in mind the keystroke stuff is kind of painful on the WebDirect stuff. Stuff comes up next week with Nick Hunter. The uh, WebDirect stuff, uh, he will be continuing that. After that, we are looking at a series of live streams on uh, building iOS interfaces. He's doing WebDirect right now, which kind of loosely can be used anywhere, including Android devices. But he's looking at doing iPhone, I think, interfaces, maybe iPad interfaces. And starting point, that'll be a multi, multi-week uh, operation of, of going through that process of learning to build with reasonable levels of 
Apple calls it the human interface guidelines. If you do a search for that, it used to be a PDF, which I would prefer. But if you say human interface guidelines from Apple or the HIG, um, these are the, and it's now this kind of web page thing. And you can talk about, well, it's the foundation of this. And you can have icons and branding and, and, and spatial layout and this and that. And it's, it's all this. Oh, yeah. Here, there's the HIG information on having the, uh, the uh, goggles, right? The, uh, the Apple Vision, the Pro Vision. Vision Pro. Yeah, so they're adding all this other stuff to it. But the, the guidelines that they want you to design for, that way the apps work in a similar sort of way. And it's not like a bunch of four-year-olds building apps that everything works totally different. So yeah, the HIG guidelines are what Nick will use on the FileMaker Go. Whether you, he talks about them or not, that's fundamentally what he will be using on that. So that'll be a couple weeks out. So with that, I don't have too much more. Labo says, yeah, there's an MBS, pl of course, MBS plugin. Creates a hash of the value, a hash returns 64 characters being one or zero. We convert the image to eight by eight, turn it grayscale, check if the pixel above have below, meaning the hash is quite immune to against. Oh, Labo 404 just outdid me, but I have to use monkey spread to do it. Labo, you get a gold star. I'm going to bring that <laughs> What did he just do? He, he, remember, I was talking about how it's off by a pixel or something? Yeah. Right. Well, Labo's like, well, you know, Carlton, you suck. I can do better than that. So this is what he put. <laughs> so I'm not going to take it too personal. I mean, Labo's still missing his dog. I don't know what you say to a guy who's lost his dog for like a year or two years. Um, quite a mean. So what he does, it, it, it returns 64 characters being one or zero. We convert to eight by eight, turn grayscale, check a pixel or above or below the mean value. The hash is quite immune against resizing, compression artifacts and huge changes um yeah yeah that's cool we, well we have to implement that because you were complaining about that the other day weren't you about I don't, it not you know, being the problem, I got other monkey bread stuff to do and as soon as you get start doing monkey bread it gets deeper right it goes from full <laughs> to deeper it, yeah it's kind of an all-consuming black hole <laughs> it's, it is all black hole right like i still have i've got the thing where i've got images coming up and i want the description of, of the image to be superimposed as text on the image Right. And then that gets output to a report. Right. So, yeah. 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 Mike's talking about AI algorithm stuff. Yeah. That's where this all comes in. But yeah, creating an immune to that would be good. So, GM image hash. So, hash is, is, is return as 64 characters. Then we convert the image to eight by eight, turn grayscale on. And then the, if you have a sample fire that labo, that might be fun. One to, if you have that, I, I don't build it if you don't have it. But if you have one floating around, that would be interesting. Oh, unless Christian Schmidt built it. That's the thing with Christian Schmidt. He's got a ton of sample files on his website. And you always ask him, you know, do you have something that does this? He's already built it. Yeah, a lot of the time. And then you go to, uh, is that or his blog or the samples? Where do I go? FileMaker plugin. And then we have the documentation. Uh, is that the samples? Is that where it's at? There's document. Yeah, these are. So you go in here and then there'll be, well, he has a folder of all the sample files that come in. When you download this, you get all the sample files. You just download it and you get all the samples that are in there. Um, there's a sample damn near for everything. It's pretty impressive. So anyway, yeah. All right, cool. All right, David A., Mikey, you guys are awesome. Mike Wallace, thank you for the contributions as well. Anyone else has got anything? We're going to wrap it up. Feel free to post something. Hey, Lab, if we have that sample, if one of you guys have that sample, just drop it in the Discord here so I can find it. It's one of the things about finding. Sometimes I have to call Chris Schmidt and ask him where he's at because he knows it's in there and then he finds it. I could spend an hour hunting through. He's got like 800 FileMaker FMP12 sample files. It's like a lot. So just finding the sample, never mind recycling it, just trying to find it. It's like, where's my child? It's gone. All right, see you.